Good morning. Does it working? Is it? Okay, thank you. Good morning all. If you're wondering what I'm doing here, I'm also wondering what I'm doing here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ivan Maric, uh, coming from neighboring country, Croatia, from, from not far from, from this lovely capital of Europe, Hung, uh, Budapest. It's not sunny weather, but I'm sure that lots of bright and lots of positive energy in the, today in the next few days. Hi, class. Late. <laughs> You're late. So let's start being familiar as we are one big family. Welcome, uh, dear distinguished guests, dear colleagues, all attendees of EOSC Symposium. Uh, the greatest, Isabel, the greatest event in the, in the roadmap of EOSC. EOSC Symposium, for those of you that are not aware, are built on the legacy of previous events. D4I, Digital Infrastructure for Research Event Series, and uh, Stakeholder Forum that was even organized by, by uh, EOS Pilot. It builds a community. Once upon a time, a long time ago, uh, there was a giant conference, launching of giant in, in, in Luxembourg, and it was three words uh, that I occasionally, all the time, I relate to any event I attend. And this is connect, communicate, collaborate. And these are the three words that can be applied here. This event will connect us, you, uh, science producer, science user, EOSC shakers and makers. By connecting, you will communicate. At, at the end of the day, I hope we all collaborate on the new things. And this is what this free intensive program of EOSC is basically devoted to one topic, how to make implementation of EOSC work. And do not, uh, do not behave nicely, behave provocative, but be positive. Be positive in an attitude that we should take something good of this and work out to make it happen, because it will happen in this or other way. So with these words in mind, I welcome you all, and I wish you all, to all of us, a successful conference, a successful event. I need a little help, of course, in my notes, but I don't see without glasses, so I don't know what help do I expect from these notes. <laughs> so let's start with the official conference. This is my first troll uh, welcoming speech, then I am uh, session chair, and I will give a presentation. So free one, this is the telecom or mobile phone industry. Uh, style of working, free in one package. So first, let's, like, uh, let's start with the welcoming speech or opening speech from our host, uh, Dr. Istvan Sabo, the Vice President of the Hungarian, sorry, the Vice Agency, agency I said, the, the agency that basically give the money to research and make a policy, <laughs> in short. Dr. Sabo is very much related to our community, his, his professional life, he works in the Ministry of Education, he is now also in the government sector, uh, and he was and is involved in inf international uh, uh, infrastructure initiatives like S3 delegates, CERN, etc., etc. So he is the right person to give us introduction and speech. Mr. Sabo, please take the floor. Does this work? Okay. Thank you. Um, so, welcome. Uh, and I would uh, like to give you a brief overview of the Hungarian concept on, uh, towards open access and, uh, and open science. Uh, because I think it's uh, quite important for you to understand how government uh, sees uh, this uh, possibility and how we put this into the broader system of, uh, of innovation ecosystem. So just basically our uh, office has quite a long name which is sometimes really hard to remember actually. Uh, it's the National Research Development and Innovation Office. It was uh, 
uh, operating as the as the research and innovation entity for for almost uh, four years. And uh, one year ago, the Ministry of Innovation and Technology was established in Hungary, and now we are operating as a, a governmental body of that cer uh, certain ministry. But uh, yes, indeed, we are the ones who provide the funding, and we are also heavily involved in policy making. And uh, our office is uh, playing a key role in, uh, in research infrastructure, international research infrastructure uh, participations. This is basically our portfolio. You can see that uh, we are involved in, in strategy and, and program planning, meaning that, for instance, uh, we are playing a, a major role in forming Hungary's new uh, RDI strategy. Uh, and also, of course, it's uh, competitive funding, which uh, is also uh, by grant providing as uh, one of our key uh, missions and we also uh, members or we are the rep representatives of Horizon 2020 and Horizon uh, Europe uh, in the future as well in Hungary. Uh, what is the most relevant part for, uh, for this, uh, this conference, I believe, is that, uh, as I mentioned, we are coordinating and financing the, the large-scale international research infrastructures. Uh, meaning that uh, we are the ones who provide the, the persons of the government, the delegates of those uh, certain uh, research infrastructures. Uh, and uh, in this sense, we are trying to make everything to foster cooperations and the, to get the most out of these research infrastructures, not only in scientific way, but also where it's possible to get some innovation out of them. Uh, and uh, we also see that, that through, the, through the basic uh, research funding, it's very important uh, to exploit the basic research results in a way as well that these research results should be connected and uh, build synergies uh, together. Uh, this, is, uh, this can be seen in the renewal of the RDA strategy as well, because as you uh, see, basically the horizontal goals, both the knowledge creation and the cooperation and knowledge transfer, knowledge exploitation are all uh, topics that are highly relevant for, for basic research as well. And at the same time, uh, we intend to, to put more emphasis on, on, uh, on the exploitation of, uh, of uh, basic research results towards innovation where it is possible. So it's very important that we do not demand basic research to become innovation at all costs, but where it is possible and where is room for improvement, there uh, we would like to see innovation making it happen. We all know the European paradox that Europe is strong in, in basic research, but is uh, not very strong in innovation. So we would like to change this uh, uh, in Hungary as well, because we believe that we are strong in basic research as well. But in innovation, as you will see, uh, we are not uh, that much strong. Uh, to this end, we uh, changed the, the funding schemes as well. On the left side, you can see that uh, uh, we had uh, quite a fragmented uh, financing of, uh, of research. And now in the new system, we, we, we have a, a research fund and an innovation fund. And basically, the research fund will fund uh, those uh, basic research project, projects which are curious at the event for individual researchers and those projects which are, which are uh, going for the institutions towards major thematic goals. And the Innovation Fund will uh, promote the business sector's uh, uh, projects. Uh, now, you have to understand that Hungary uh, has uh, uh, certain financial resources available, but as you can see on this uh, figure, most of them are coming from the cohesion policy instruments. Our office is basically responsible for the left side of this, uh, this chart, so the domestic sources, but you can see that there is a shift in magnitude uh, between the, the middle and the left side of, the, of this uh, figure. And we also have direct access to, to international funding as well, like uh, all other European countries. And from this, I would say, bag, we try to, uh, to split the resources in a way that the most uh, will come uh, out for, uh, for Hungary. Uh, this is especially important uh, because uh, our index expenditure in Hungary is, is, is rising now, and we are happy with that. But you see that there was a, as a break in, in uh, financing, and that break was caused basically by the uh, lack of governmental financing, to be very honest, if you take a closer look at this chart. And now we try to put more money, actually, uh, from the government side in research and development, so that we will, uh, we hope that we will reach the 1.8% uh, of GDP uh, spending for R&D by 2020. Uh, now we put uh, more money in the in the R&D system from government side as well. So we hope that we, we can achieve uh, this goal. But as I mentioned, uh, we are quite uh, behind, lagging behind in innovation. Uh, and in our strategy, it's uh, our dedicated goal to step uh, one step further in each year. 
uh, hopefully the British will leave uh, soon and then we will have uh, one step further by next year. But we would also like to, to make it actually happen uh, for, uh, through bringing uh, in innovative projects uh, from basic research where it is possible as well. Uh, we are actually uh, members in, in quite a few uh, international corporations, as I mentioned. This is a, uh, a nice uh, folio of, of them where you can see our participations. Everybody can pick its uh, own uh, favorite. Uh, and it's, it's, it is very important that uh, we actually look at uh, EOS as, as a research infrastructure in this sense with a distributed uh, node uh, network. Uh, and and we, we try to handle uh, EOS in a way uh, because it, it's very important that uh, uh, that EOS can serve as a, as a very horizontal infrastructure which basically supports all our other, other research infrastructure uh, initiatives. Uh, the research infrastructures are very important not only at national level like this slide says but also uh, from uh, for all uh, society, I believe, because research infrastructures, if you consider the, the concept of triple headaches where government, business sector, and academia is, is uh, playing together to, to make more out of innovation, basically these three uh, partners can contribute very nicely in, in the field of research infrastructures because, of course, the government makes the regulation, or, uh, provides the funding to it, academic sector provides the researchers, and business sector potentially can get out innovations out of uh, research infrastructures. Uh, and it's also very important that these could be the, uh, I would say, the pilot points where the, the open science and open access could be uh, achieved because uh, in, in research infrastructures case open science is I would say a necessity because everybody has to cooperate somehow with, with, the, with the other uh, colleagues and it's uh, also very important that science uh, resources are very scarce meaning uh, that uh, we don't have all words money to support science so therefore as, as I mentioned in institutional level there are thematical goals not only in Hungary but uh, in other countries as well uh, so where the results are uh, available, it should, they should be shared actually uh, with, with each other. Uh, we basically support EOS from the, from the very beginning and uh, we very much uh, believe that uh, this combining of openness, fair data and ICT infrastructure centers are, are, uh, are very important. <clears throat> and we also uh, understand cloud as, as an infrastructure in, in a sense of, of a classical research infrastructure where we don't necessarily uh, understand under the, the phrasing infrastructure just the equipment, but also the necessary services, necessary personnel, etc., which are added to it. And we, we put uh, EOS uh, in, in this uh, sense. Uh, we think that EOS is a, is a very uh, promising framework, basically, and will enhance uh, scientific research. And it's also very important that it will improve uh, societal innovation, which uh, is, again, a, a paradigm shift or a mindset change for, for researcher community. Uh, in many cases, still, the, the closed science, I would say that my research results are belong to me concept is, is still uh, very strong. But we do hope that through the, these initiatives, uh, the open science and open innovation can uh, go uh, hand by hand, basically. The open innovation concept meaning that, for instance, uh, a company brings in knowledge from uh, another company uh, when it's making innovation of, or uh, research and development. And we do hope that in science this will also happen through the, the sharing of, uh, of uh, scientific uh, data as well. And it's very important that, uh, of course, the sharing of publication is, is uh, equally important, but the sharing of research data might be uh, more important, uh, actually. Uh, the on the development and implementation of EOS, we see that uh, uh, basically this uh, kind of infrastructure, as I mentioned, is a horizontal type of infrastructure, meaning that it could serve as a very good basis and background for all uh, research infrastructures. But there are some challenges uh, which, uh, which can be seen now. Actually, uh, on the governmental side, for instance, the legal regulation is uh, very important. Also, the financing issues uh, are of critical importance. And, of course, human capacities uh, are, uh, again, uh, scarce resources, uh, especially in ICT. Uh, and also, besides these challenges, uh, it's uh, very important to to transfer, make a transition, for instance, from governance to sustainability, or from European to a, to a much more global spread 
of, uh, of open science concept. However, we, of course, I must note that science has been also, uh, has also always been an open uh, thing, I would say. So uh, science by itself, uh, just or a scientist by itself, uh, can uh, hardly achieve any uh, breakthrough results uh, nowadays. But now uh, we have to step one step further and basically making uh, science as open as possible. Uh, and this is uh, basically our, our concept. Uh, we already took some measures towards uh, open uh, openness, I would say. Uh, even in, in 1999, we had an act on, on copyright, where basically all libraries and public, publication, uh, public collections had to digitalize their collection and uh, make it freely available. And also in the National Higher Education uh, Amendment, the, the uh, open access of the doctoral dissertations are, are prerequisites as well. However, we must know that, know that this uh, uh, legalization doesn't involve uh, issues on data management, which I think is the uh, next and very important step uh, towards uh, advancing further, basically, uh, on, on open uh, access. Uh, our office introduced, uh, back in 2014, actually, an open access mandate, meaning that uh, publications should be, should, be, should be open access. And uh, uh, when we found projects from the National Research Development Innovation Fund, and as, and as I mentioned, this fund is the basically funds about, I don't know, 95% of uh, individual basic research grants in Hungary. So this is uh, quite a, has, has a quite a huge impact. Uh, we demand that actually open access must be made. And also for, for the research project budgets, uh, a certain amount, this 2.5% of the funding, is locate, allocated uh, to form the project so that open access uh, will be possible. Also, Hungarian Academy of Sciences introduced uh, its open access uh, mandate back in 2013. So I think that the, we made uh, significant uh, uh, changes uh, in, in the meantime. And also, uh, Hungary was, was the very, among the very first ones uh, to basically uh, being part in uh, e-infrastructures because we believe that these are uh, very important. Also in Hungary we have uh, quite a strong background uh, regarding uh, ICT and, uh, and uh, e-infrastructures. So therefore we believe that uh, we have to uh, take part in uh, these projects. And you can see that uh, in, the, in the open access pilot and in the open access infrastructure for Research Europe, so the Open Era project, uh, we have uh, always been uh, active uh, members. Uh, we established in, in 2008 actually uh, uh, the Hungarian Open Repositories. Uh, which uh, is basically uh, consists of libraries of the, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and also other libraries uh, like the Debrecen University, uh, which uh, uh, consists of a whole of 30 C repositories in, in the country. But uh, while we believe that uh, these are very important, we have to make one step further. And I think that this symposium and this uh, whole initiative can boost this uh, much further because it can be seen that it uh, happened basically in 2008. Now we are writing 2019. Uh, and actually, there is still much room for improvement in Hungary and I think for the whole uh, scientific uh, community as well. Uh, but we have, a, I would say, a, a solid bricks to build on uh, the other uh, other points uh, where we could basically uh, advance towards uh, uh, the open access uh, practices. Uh, the, the HUNOR, the Hungarian Open Repositories mission, uh, can be seen here. Basically, it's, it's for promoting Hungarian research uh, and the effective dissemination of, uh, of scientific outputs. And it's uh, very important that it's running a methodology center. So it's basically a a think tank, I would say, for Hungary uh, towards uh, the how to implement open access. Uh, and I think that uh, it is basically the partner of, uh, for EOS uh, activities. Um, the Research Data Alliance of Europe has a Hungarian node, uh, the, the Hungarian Research Data Alliance as well, uh, which is uh, basically to, to develop and support the Hungarian uh, uh, research data management community. Uh, they are trying to promote the RDA memberships and etc. I guess uh, everybody is well educated in the room so that everybody carrying the, the slides will be a very elaborator. But uh, to, to sum this up, uh, basically we see that uh, in, uh, in uh, Hungary we have the necessary 
points to build on actually further towards open access and we very much uh, would like to see open access happen in, in, uh, in Europe basically because uh, uh, and not just through the publications but through the data sharing as well and also it might be of importance that the data sharing can have an impact uh, on innovation as well not just uh, scientific data because for instance uh, many uh, non-conventional data uh, for instance that are created at certain research infrastructures like if you uh, think of uh, let's say just the biggest one CERN so if CERN has a, a certain data data uh, management system which uh, basically involves just the operation of, of the scientific equipment, those data and those uh, results which come out it could be applied for industry usage as well. So it's uh, if the industry 4.0 concept could be based upon uh, the scientific data uh, usage as well. So there is, uh, there is room for uh, innovation we believe as well. But nevertheless for science we believe it's a very key uh, aspect to, to bring open uh, access uh, towards uh, a much elevated way. And we do hope that uh, the, uh, this initiative uh, will uh, bring actually more, uh, much more to it. And we don't know where we are heading to. Actually, it it's, uh, it's, uh, always indicates that you, you have seen from the numbers that back in 2008 and back in etc. Cetera, et cetera. So yes, actually, it, it is what, uh, quite a lengthy journey and it will be pretty, I'm pretty sure that it will be uh, an even longer one. But let's hope that we can shorten this by uh, cooperating together and, and uh, forming an open innovation and open science community that, that will have an impact. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sabo. If there is any question right now, for no, okay. So we can move on with the next speaker, and that is me, to introduce myself, okay. I'm Ivan Maric, as I said in previous welcome speech. I will give a talk uh, from a position of one of my many hats that I wear, you know, in a small country. Uh, and I will touch uh, in my presentation on the last slide. We have this opportunity that uh, we concentrate all these um, uh, hypes, buzzwords, and all these things to the single person or a small amount of person, so we don't have a problems in complexity of, of different approaches. So my role is here to give you a presentation on, on uh, EOS Governance Board, which I am Croatian delegate. Uh, but also I will give you some insight from my uh, basic position and I am uh, technical director or CTO, deputy director at the University Computing Center, University of Zagreb, Srce, as one of two major uh, e-infrastructure organization in, in Croatia. Okay, I already welcome you all and I'm glad uh, to see you all, most of you that I know. For those of you that are not yet familiar with the EOSC, I have to repeat uh, the vision and values that are guided us to, 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 this, uh, to this thing and the three days that we will hope that we will just talk and discuss about EOSC, but perhaps some other topics also should be discussed. But all of them, I'm sure, are related to, to, to EOSC. And I'm using this Vienna Declaration vision of EOSC and basically what we are doing is basically building then uh, designing a virtual commons and uh, as every commons as Istvan already said any commons is based on a culture of sharing and to, m to me sometimes when I uh, want to find a par parallel of, of EOSC or any other community actions that we are doing in Europe, it's basically rely on the basic culture and this is the culture of sharing. And what we are doing right now, it will succeed or it will fail if we have this culture or if we build this culture in, in a community, in a, in a research up to the each individu individual. And this is for me, uh, in my opinion, the, the culture that we should spread. And the EOSC is basically the, the same thing. Uh, by federating data and services, we add value to research. Uh, we are hoping that using the modern IT services that we will do revolutionize the way research is done, the way the research collects and share information. 
And uh, in doing this, we are guided by some common values. Basically, as long as we are focused on science, as long as we put science or research on the frontier and, and be a role model that we will build EOSC or any other, any other initiative in Europe, we will be okay. If we build EOSC as an attractive place and attractiveness is based on content that will be in EOSC and content are data and services, fair data, fair services, it will be attractive as long as uh, me as science producer and me as science consumer are attracted by this place, coming to this place to find new ideas, uh, new things that will make my brain more innovative and that will make me do collaboration with, will, will, with other colleagues. And that, that is the success of U European Open Science Client to be attractive and to remain attractive, not to compete, not to be commercialized, not to go in, in the field where, where there is already other clouds, other players with attractiveness of some different uh, kind. But as long as we are keeping uh, EOSC attractive for scientists, for science purpose, then the EOSC will succeed. And of course, EOSC is open by default, closed when needed, transparent, inclusive, community driven and all this value. Okay, I get a problem with, <laughs> with this with this slide, but <laughs> it's it's something <laughs> sorry. <laughs> on my original on my original this is the full of years from two thousand fifteen to two thousand eighteen. Just imagine there there is a silos years and lots of policy documents originated by European Commission, Parliament. Well, that's what happened when I'm doing presentation on my Mac and I'm sending presentation to someone on Windows and <laughs> interoperability issues. Okay, so basically uh, what is given here that this is not the new idea, this idea of EOSC is uh, happening over the years and uh, it started basically in 2016 in, in communication given by European Commission inside the European Cloud Initiative as a part of digital single market and, and first time Commission give this uh, vision of the, of the EOSC basically mentioning the, what is here mentioned, the objective uh, to offer to 1.7 million European researchers and 70 million, this is the scope, basically very well defined scope, open, seamless services, storage, data management, analyze research, etc., etc. And then you don't see, but you can <laughs> imagine over the years, 2017, 2018, lots of policy uh, were created, lots of actions were created, and, and basically we were ready in this four years period to, to launch and to do first phase, implementation phase, which will I send, uh, show you later. But uh, it's not just the, 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 the thing that, this is nice picture, it's not just that it start from me, and this is the, the, the dangerous thing in many of our community, you know the, the effect of, I am the, the one that start the thing nobody before me do anything. But uh, in Europe we have this nice habit that over decades we are, evo we are in some kind of evolution and we are go taking good stuff from each of us, from each activity, and we are continuing to evaluate ev ev in evolution of good things. There was another policy body, ERG, which I am also a member of, my second head, uh, started in 2005-2006 and basically policy body which was filled with the uh, member states, associated country representative discussing around the infrastructure. And the same or similar things happened there. Uh, the main tools of ERG are roadmaps, white papers, so basically paperwork, but still influential paperwork. With this paper we come home to our ministries or to EC and pursue them. This is what we think should be done. In uh, roadmap in 2012, first uh, mention of uh, infrastructure commons, then in white paper and in ERG roadmap 2016, infrastructure is defined and, and this roadmap is basically in line with the European Commission uh, communication. 
And, and, and you can see the basic illustration of what, what we are discussing. So we have a vertical research infrastructure, we have a horizontal e-infrastructure, which contains networking, computing, data, etc., etc. So this is the e-infrastructure commons that is recognized, that is needed, that will um, foster the research, that we have to come to the uh, nice map. There is a win-win situation, no overlapping, no extra money spent no parallel work, uh, no complexity. So basically, in a real e-commons, when there is a culture of sharing behind, we will have this e-infrastructure, pan e infrastructure European commons that will be used and shared by, by all research communities. And there are two recommendations from these uh, roadmaps that I would like to take your attention on, which are very valid uh, still even now, and this is basically the architectural model of e EOSC should relay on well-known European tiering model. In network, we have three tier models starting from institutional, national, regional, and then pan-European networking. It is very similar in, in other area, in computing, in uh, data repositories, in services, etc., etc. And the basic building block, in, our, in my opinion, in our opinion, because I'm a member state representative in all these fora, is that we should have to build na strong national blocks. We should have to build strong Hungarian uh, block that is a part of, of EOSC. We should have to build uh, Croatian, Sweden, and all other national blocks. And this is where we should recommend to our governments to take a measure, take a recommendation that these national building blocks are built and to introduce national funding uh, to make it more economy scale, etc., etc., And then to connect this, of course, interconnect these national building blocks by pan-European counterparts. So these two diagrams just show that in Europe we have a nice habit of evolution of things. Uh, we are not reinventing the wheel, so many other initiatives were there, like any other project, like I'm in networking, basically I start with networking and I, for the last 25 years doing networking, I'm seeing what Europe provided through Giant and NRENs to, and this is what we should take as a role model in all, in all other fields. So we have built up on this vision to launch, we have built the implementation phase, and this is the two-year phase with the, with the governance structure. Okay. Someone has to govern this implementation phase. There are basically, uh, on this image, you can see the main actors. I would say, in my opinion, executive board with, the wor with its working group are the forcing element of, of implementation of EOSC. There is governance board, which I am a member of, uh, or member states, creation delegates, and all other uh, are just steering the implementation, trying to review, endorse, etc. Stakeholder forum, and there is uh, lots of EU-funded projects, national initiatives, etc., etc., as, as a concrete tools that will contribute to the implementation. And of course, there is a huge help from EOS Secretariat in coordination and support action. So this is basically the, the governance that we are currently have in, in a, in a two-year phase of implementation of EOSC that we are aiming for. So a little bit about the body that I am a member of and I am asked to give a speech here. Uh, and because Croatia is the next rotation presidency. So uh, we have all, uh, a, a body that um, is filled with 28 member states representative and 12, 11 associated countries, so we are all here. On November meeting, it was just 10 days ago, there was 75 delegates, not including me because I was at Jean GA. So there is this issue of overlapping of too many activities in Europe and probably if we coordinate ourselves, uh, we will make this not a problem in the future. So what are the mandate of the governance board? Basically, the adopted mandate is to deliberate, not the strategic orientation of EOSC, but we have a basically a um, framework of in, um, or, or limited uh, orientation on the actions that are related in uh, Horizon 2020. 
uh, that can influence the implementation of EOSC uh, 2020. And in that role, we are providing advices, informed strategic configurations. And this is in a form if we, uh, as a governance board, we, we, we suggest changes in work program or priorities in, in a certain call. Beyond this, recommending to the strategic configuration choices on uh, Horizon 2020 uh, priorities, we also exchange views from member states, we form some opinions, and we, we provide recommendation to executive board to, to design working groups, to how, uh, for example, should we design post-2020 governance structure, financial framework, or even legal legal body. And it is important uh, to know that governance board will, will finish of its existence in 2020, end of 2020. This is just a timeline of the key, key important things that happened in January. Uh, we set up governance board and the last meeting that was done on 15th of November there was discussion, deep discussion about working groups, about results, uh, and about partnership in, in concrete. And this gave me to the uh, uh, slide of current issues that we are dealing with. And, and of course, the first thing is basically re related to Stroman Report Sustainability Working Group, which I already said. So this is about post uh, EOSC 2020 uh, uh, operations, financing model, governance structure, legal vehicle. One of the current issues, of course, you will discuss it during these days, is uh, what legal form of EOSC will be after 2020. Yet another body, yet another membership from position of my country or something different. And how this legal body will, will, will uh, put uh, will fit into the mos current mosaic of, of uh, European infrastructure scene. And then there is, all, of course, the, this uh, high discussion and very urgent discussion on partnership. Uh, just, to, to re uh, just to rephrase what the partnership is, basically according to, to field work proposal from March this year, partnership is an initiative um, prepared by by union in cooperation with member states and and associate and or associated country and and private sector and or public sector um, jointly supporting basically they all commit to jointly to, to support development and implementation of that initiative so if eos become partnership then there is a joint commitment of these free, free, free sectors to, to develop and, and to implement the, the EOSC. So there are different uh, flavor of this partnership. Partnership option, co-program, co-funded or institutional based, uh, like, I don't know, Euro HPC uh, joint undertaken is example of institutional partnership. So these are the currently very hot topics on the governance board, but not only on governance board. And on 16 December, there will be a decision on partnership um, taken by governance board. And then until February uh, 2020, the, the full proposal, how this partnership will look like, uh, basically have to be defined with detailed governance, quantitative figures, et cetera, et cetera. And, and these are the topics that governance board take and discuss during its meeting, last meeting. We have close collaboration with the executive board. In, in 10 days from now, we will have a joint meeting in Milano. And, and this, this way how we do. Of course, stakeholder uh, symposium is the right place to discuss openly this issue also. So we can take input from here that will benefit our decision and our discussion. Uh, as you know, the, the EOS working group are the formal form or official part of, of the governance that I show at the beginning, but it's our, I think it's the most important part at this point. It's a community sourced, community driven uh, groups with the experts, with the subject matter experts, with the key person, with a huge knowledge in this. And there are five priorities, five working groups that uh, are basically these two days or three days will be devoted, so I will skip this 
what is the role of each, uh, well, the name of each working group indicate the role of this, of the, of the working group. Uh, my message is that these are, we are law looking for the results of this working group because the, this will dictate implementation, but after the implementation period. Uh, and this will frame, give the basic frame of how attractive uh, uh, EOSC or content attractive EOSC we will build at the end. One thing is make it attractive, another thing is to make it too complicated, then it's basically we should, we should uh, do something about it. So there is huge interaction between uh, working groups, of course, on a daily basis. Working group chairs are, I think, here, and they are, they, are, um, they are doing this orchestration of their work, but also uh, interaction with other working groups. Governance boards also, in his remit, his mandate, we have, a, um, we have a, well, we can establish uh, subgroups from our remits of work. These subgroups are becoming executable subgroups. Uh, and there are f currently three of them that are under charge. And there is uh, the final slide, which is taken from, uh, from Open Science Cloud Strategic Inter Implementation Plan, the new document, which I'm sure you all read and, and, and familiar with all details in this document. Uh, and there are uh, yellow and blue boxes here. Uh, yellow are uh, projects uh, results. Uh, all, all project uh, related from EOSC or related to EOSC and what are the, the results that expected in timeline. So at the end of this year, we will have federating core, we will have updated catalog, et cetera, et cetera. In 2020, we will help connect it most of the infrastructure and services to EOSC. And from the governance uh, point of view, we will have initial rules of participation, uh, uh, first results of mapping, landscape mapping of EOSC relevant national initiatives, not just through landscape uh, working group, but also through 5B projects that are currently, uh, currently uh, going. And um, also this strategic, strategic financing organizational model or first result of sustainability working group will be in Q3. And then in Q4 we will take all these member states, European Commission, and do evaluation of the first phase. So time is very ambitious. So in this ambitious time, the stress level is high in all of us, so there is a good, harm, there is a good tool to relieve the stress. And sometimes co-chairs of executive board send us this illustration from Far East meditation, Zen philosophy, etc. just to, to release this stress level in all of us, there is a timeline, there is a pushing in timeline, but okay guys, we will make it. We will make it one way or another. But uh, what I choose in this illustration as a harmony is basically the, the other definition of harmony. Of course, Beethoven and Mozart are our goal uh, to have a perfect sound, but what, for me, definition of harmony is basically compatibility in opinion and, and actions. And this is what we have to provide. Our actions, our opinion have to be compatible, not fully agreeable, but compatible. And that's why for me, basically, the coordination is a key element in this phase. We have to coordinate. We are, we are uh, if you want, uh, to achieve at least the level of harmony, we, we should start to coordinate. We will start with low-hanging fruits, with the uh, most viable products, uh, uh, and, and this is the way that either we do coordination or we will do opposite of coordination and then we will remain blind till the end of this, uh, this exercise. Uh, beside the harmony, I use another illustration, and this is awareness. Because as long as we are making this attractive place, new attractive place on the scene, I think that uh, at the end of the day, it will be the measure how attractive this place is. And I lose illustration of my country. This is the Google Trend uh, diagram that shows in a five years period one peak. And this peak was a result of one month of what activity? Does anybody know? No. So this, in this period, uh, 
Croatia was mentioned 60 billion impression in all social media, more than from our beginning of existence in the last 27 years. And this is due to, to, to we beat England on this. <laughs> and that, uh, at that point, uh, my friends from UK decided that they will leave uh, Europe during the Croatian presidency. <laughs> in respect of how, <laughs> how nice football team we have. So basically this is, this is kind of attraction that we would like to, to, to achieve with EOS, not this kind because it's impossible to, <laughs> to achieve um, this kind of repression, but this is something that we should aim for. And, uh, sorry. And of course, uh, it is our goal. And we find that uh, to achieve this goal, we have to spend some time or some energy for, for uh, pushing the adoption, uh, uh, making users aware that there is EOS, because if I look at this room, I don't see too much unfamiliar faces. I'm sorry to say that, because we are all uh, certainly around our conferences. So adoption for me is very important, and not just for me. In the meeting in 11 September, Croatian and Ireland delegates Governance Board delegates proposed the creation of subgroups focusing on, on adoption of EOSC by different stakeholders. What I have in mind is basically that what we are building right now, we are building for the next generation. And this next generation is still sitting in the, in the university, on the faculties. These are the new kids on the block. These are the new scientists. And basically, uh, what we are doing here is we have to, through education, adopt to this new generation that is coming. So I have one more minute, and I have lots of slides to show, so I will speed it up. So a landscape is uh, what we are doing here, but landscape is already done in ERG, and this is second slide that I mentioned in ERG. There was a landscape, and uh, one result of that landscape is basically showing that uh, horizontal infrastructure and vertical infrastructure are basically 50-50, looking from the country perspective, uh, are integrated. And recommendation is, of course, that we should increase the level of integration. So I will, I will take five minutes more, because I'm here also as a Croatian representative, so I will show you how Croatian infrastructure commons looks like this year. So we have National Academic Research Network, CARNET, connected to GEANT. Uh, Carnet is connecting academic research communities, but also schools, etc., etc. We have a different flavor of computing run by CERCE. We started National Grid Initiative in 2003 4 by, by uh, Croatian project, uh, multi partner, multi national, uh, multi partner project with different institutions. We have HPC cluster as, as a part of 2002 EDG project, and we have built our own cloud infrastructure, providing virtual machines, not one petabyte, but many more storage infrastructure to our community. And these are, together with, uh, we shouldn't forget the middleware, the authentication authorization infrastructure. In Croatia, we have one million identities because we provide identities to schools. And these are basically our infrastructure commons, Croatia, and this is this national block. We have, of course, challenges like any other, and this is related to financing, uh, resource, undercapacity, sustainability, etc., etc. And, of course, some issues of coordination and integration with research infrastructure. So the, the, the tool to solve this problem is the Croatian Scientific and Educational Cloud uh, Strategy Fund uh, Finance Project, 26 million euro, with the aim to build infrastructure components that I just showed to the level that are capable to join uh, with the European counterparts and to make European uh, creation uh, research community re research area connected to European research area. All these things are just now happening. We have sm slightly problem with the procurements, so not should be in production 2021, but now it's 12 months late. In a research data layer infrastructure, we started with the first initiatives in the uh, beginning of 2000 with the repository of scientific publications, very much famous. Those are the names in Croatia, Hrčak is hamster, Dabar is beaver, so these are all the elements of zoo, so animals, so we are very constructive in these uh, names. And we built, in 2015, we built national uh, digital 
repository infrastructure called Dabar, which is currently holding 134 digital repositories, 14 categories of digital objects, and we are not satisfied with the percentage of open access um, percentages, less than 50% of these objects or repositories are in open access mode. But we are providing platform, we are not pushing for, for uh, repository uh, owners for this. There are many more activities that we are related in Europe. I just mentioned two. Uh, we are now officially uh, initiate, established national RDA node in Croatia. And we are part of NIFOS project, one of the 5B projects with the idea of establishing or promoting national initiative in open science. But I would like to emphasize still, aside from this data, uh, e-infrastructure services uh, in Croatia, we realized that we would like to have, because we have information system covering higher education for the last two decades, but we never uh, realized the information system in research. And, and basically we are now building CRORIS, which is national CRIS system. And this is basically giving us information on processes, equipment, services, events, etc., etc. Why? Why? Because our policy decision making is based on what? Based on data. If you don't have correct data, then your, your uh, decisions are not so uh, uh, data-based. So the base, this, is, will be, this system will be based for informed decision making. And my personal wish is basically that we connect all such information system across Europe and then landscaping will be very easy, not through uh, manual questionnaire. And my last slide is basically, as I announced, next year we will take in the rotation creation presidency, and there are two, two basically two uh, priorities as a priority in, in, in the area of science. First one is brain circulation and future job. So there is this brain circulation is basically, in a short, we would like to transfer brain drain to brain circulation. We think that brain circulation is basically the power or the one of the main avenue of a strong European research area, mobility and brain circulation. But for some of our countries, uh, the problem is brain drain. And we think that uh, in, in Europe, there should be a fair principles dealing with this issue. It's different for different country, but the goal of our, my, uh, my country presidency is to put this on action. Also the future jobs, Basically, some statistics say that today education is educating uh, the kids for the 60 to 80 percent of jobs that will disappear at the time that they are finishing school. So this is the, the, the priority and we are hoping that we can make national open science elements plus European open science cloud designed to help to solve these two big problems, big issues. And this is what we are doing basically. Uh, using IT, using all these issues to, to make benefits for the economies, for the society. And that's all, and this is the word for Kusenam. This is thank you in, in, in Hungarian. Okay, sorry for a little bit too long presentation. <laughs> I, will I will not take the, 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 the question right now because we are bit late, but I will announce the next speaker, and the next speaker is uh, Jean-Francois Abramatik, uh, my colleague from executive board of EOSC, and at the same time, uh, Jean-Pierre is uh, architecture world group chair, but more important, he is one of the pioneers in internet and World Wide Web, and once upon a time, he was a chairman of World Wide Web Association. So, Jean-Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan, and also thank you for uh, welcoming a French citizen by mentioning the World Cup of last year. So it was, it was very nice of you. Um, okay, so yes, uh, as Ivan said, I'm a member of the executive board, but uh, first he made a great presentation of the governance, uh, uh, Ivan made a great presentation of the governance of, uh, of EOSC. So, and for me, I was asked to talk today, but in my old capacity, right? In my capacity, it, uh, the, I used, as uh, Ivan just mentioned, I was uh, the W3C chairman from 96 to 2001. And uh, the idea here is that uh, I share with you a little bit of history, right? So uh, 
and trying to find lessons learned. We know it's not carbon copy, right? EOSC is not carbon copy, W3C in any way. But when you are launching in such a new and such an ambitious activity as EOSC, it's good to look at similar or close by activities that uh, have uh, been going on before. So the spirit of the presentation is lessons learned, right? And uh, lessons learned means you talk about history and therefore I could have go back to Moses or to the Indian legend and the elephant, uh, but uh, uh, for the web, I chose to, uh, oops, I chose to just go back to 1945. Uh, why? Because in the web community, when we talk about history, this is basically the time zero, right? Why is it time zero? Uh, because Vannevar Bush, who to make it simple, was the Ministry of Research of the US uh, when, the year, when the war end, ended, had managed uh, all the scientists during the war to develop what was needed to win the war. Uh, in 1945, reflected uh, and uh, delivered this article, as we may think, that uh, the web community in general consider as the original document. And uh, actually, when we talk about EOSC, uh, we see that, uh, I have an extract here of the, the summary, um, Vannevar Butch urges that men of science should turn to the massive task of making more accessible our bewildering store of knowledge. That doesn't sound familiar. Uh, 1945, okay? Or now, says Dr. Bush, instruments will give man access to and comment over the inherited knowledge of the ages. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so uh, in the same article, Vannevar Bush uh, had the idea of a machine, which he called Memex, uh, that would allow to implement that. And that machine had uh, something that would look like hyperlinks, for example. Uh, now, you have to remember that the transistor was invented in 1947. So, uh, Vannevar Bush was living in an analog world. Still, he had the idea uh, of, you know, connecting, you know, structuring the knowledge of mankind in such a way that elements would be linked to each other. Of course, the Memex machine never, saw, uh, n never existed, right, because it was too tough. And uh, fast forward 20 years, the first time uh, the ideas that we're using every day were presented uh, to, to the public was uh, in 1968 when Doug, Doug Engelbart delivered the uh, mother of all demos. So for those who do not know mother of all demos, I encourage you to go to YouTube, you tap mother of all demos, and you will get the 90 minute demo made by Doug Engelbart uh, during a conference in San Francisco. Even for those of you who cannot stand 90 minutes, uh, and now you're for the 21st century and you want it to look at it through series, uh, there are chunks of 20 minutes, so you can watch one every night and stuff, right? So uh, anyway, uh, in, this, in this demo, uh, Engelbart talk about the, the goal of his life is to augment human intellect. And uh, he had developed this uh, online system where he showed uh, man-machine interaction like it had never been before. By the way, in passing, Doug Engelbart is the inventor of the mouse, right? So it's the first time during this demo that a mouse built in wood by, you know, some uh, <laughs> mechanics engineer in the in uh, the Engelbart uh, laboratory. So th there is a mouse that you will see if you look at the demo. But there is also hypertext. There is also a video conference. There is a moment where Engelbart talk with a distant colleague who is 40 kilometers away from San Francisco is in Menlo Park, but they share uh, information and so forth. So uh, that's the first time. So Memex, Vannevar Bush, could not, never saw the light. Uh, uh, Doug Engelbart is the first research demo of all the concepts that we are using every day uh, now. Uh, in passing, uh, a few days ago, on October 29th, we, uh, it was the 50th uh, anniversary of the internet. The first connection of four nodes 
uh, uh, was held in, uh, at that date uh, in the US, and uh, SRI, the laboratory of Doug Engelbart, was one of the four nodes, uh, which, uh, so not only he was able to make the demo of the man-machine interaction, the hypertext, and so forth, but he was also uh, a precursor in the deployment of the internet. Uh, Doug also, uh, well, is, con is considered as the father uh, for, for the web community. And uh, for example, in one of the World Wide Web Conference, uh, he co-signed with Tim Berners-Lee the boosting our collective IQ. So yet again, we're in open science, sharing information and so forth. Doug, uh, I had the chance to meet Doug Engelbart uh, once when he came to MIT when I was W3C chairman. And uh, this is a moment you cannot forget. Uh, he, as I often say to my children and grandchildren, the most admirable people are the most humble. Doug was really an humble person. He was talking with a soft voice, and uh, that's a, a memory that uh, I cannot forget. Now, let's go back to the web. Uh, 20 years later, 1989, Tim Berners-Lee uh, produced the document which is on the left here. Uh, the title of which, of which is uh, Information Management and Proposal. Uh, you have, you cannot see from the back of the room, but uh, you have the comment from his boss at the top of the, the document, vague but exciting, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so that led to what we know uh, today uh, as the web. Uh, the green logo is, uh, is the first logo uh, for the web. And uh, you probably know, for those at least to our age comparable to me, that the real ramp up uh, came with Mosaic, uh, the browser developed by NCSA at the University of Illinois, uh, was available, be became available. Here I want to stop a second because this is one of the first lessons learned that I encourage to you to think about. Uh, Tim had a vision of the web where uh, the, the first user agent that he developed could read and write. You could author as well as browse the information that was on the initial web that he had developed. So that was his vision. Uh, Mosaic uh, was only a browser, as you know. And it took uh, social networks uh, almost uh, you know, 15 years later, wiki, or wiki first and then Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, to give to the user the capacity to enter information easily, right? Uh, so, I look at it as the minimum viable web, right? The mosaic was, uh, we'll talk about that when I compare to, to, the, to EOS later, but uh, when we have a vision, when we have a goal, doesn't mean that you have to accomplish everything immediately. This is a great example of a subsample of the vision of the web, uh, mosaic, the browser only, that was, uh, I think I don't have to comment. It was obviously critical in the deployment of the web. Uh, then the second idea from Tim that, uh, you know, as many other people, he could have uh, created a startup company. Actually, he did create a startup company a year ago, right? Uh, but uh, at that time, he decided to create the World Wide Web Consortium because he wanted to lead the web to its full potential. So it was in, in, inspired by the X Window Consortium, uh, which had uh, been developed earlier uh, at MIT, was about graphics interface uh, on the network. But uh, from the idea of the X Window Consortium, he kept you know, the experience, so lesson learned, the experience of MIT, who had done it for the, for the X Window standards a couple of years earlier. But he extended it by saying, I don't want a single host. I want hosts all over the world. Otherwise, I, I will not deserve the first two W's of the World Wide Web, right? If, if the design is done in Boston. So the host, uh, the, the list of hosts was extended to MIT. Well, of course, for Europe, CERN was the candidate. I won't get into the details. There are CERN employees in the room here, but uh, in uh, 1994, CERN got the mandate to develop the Large Hadron Collider, which has been developed since then, uh, produced a few more uh, Nobel laureates, uh, and uh, the boss uh, said uh, we need to focus on d designing the, the, the Large Hadron Collider, so no secondary uh, effort and so forth. So uh, uh, Tim had to look for another 
for another host for Europe, and he chose INRIA. That's why I'm speaking to you today uh, about the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, when I became chair, my next task was to extend it to Asia, so I negotiated the, the relationship with the University of Keio in Japan, and later, after I had left, uh, China and, uh, engaged with the University of Beijing. So what's the consortium? It's, uh, today it's 450 plus members from all over, uh, from all over the world. Uh, it has produced over the last 25 years more than 300 recommendations. Uh, it addresses all aspects uh, you have on the right hand side, design and application, connection of any device, semantic web, web architecture and so on. Uh, I just stressed on the left hand side the attention to accessibility with the web accessibility initiative, the attention of internationalization, so each working group, whichever they are, has to address the internationalization issue and also uh, an IPR uh, premiere from the World Wide Web Consortium, the creation of the royalty-free policy uh, so that you know, any standards from W3C can be used without, you know, uh, without any uh, threat uh, of being pursued uh, money-wise since uh, the W3C has a royalty-free policy. Uh, okay, the consortium was to enable the web to deploy, right? And uh, so the, Tim uh, very often mentioned, uh, let you know, thousands of flower blossom, right? Uh, Tim a la Sherman Mao, right? Uh, and I will just mention uh, two flowers. Uh, the first is uh, the search engine. Uh, on the, not because I want to promote the company who is now leading it, but uh, because I have a lot of respect for the two scientists, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who produced the paper was on the left hand side here at the World Wide Web Conference in Brisbane in 1998. And the title says, The Anatomy of a Large-Scale Hypertextual Web Search Engine. So large-scale web search engine, and you have the numbers of, here I chose the searches, I could have also uh, used the same, a, a similar diagram for uh, pages uh, indexed, and the shape of the curve would be the same. The numbers would be different, but the shape of the, care, uh, of the curve would be the same. Right, so the reason I chose that flower is because uh, for EOSC, we have to think about how to develop a search engine. So that's the search. Uh, but in, in order for the search to exist, you need to have populate the information uh, on the web. And the second flower is, uh, is uh, Wikipedia, right? Uh, which is, uh, you, you have the, the numbers on the right hand side in 2001. Uh, Jimmy Wells saying, we got over 3,000 pages already. We want to make over 100,000, right? Uh, so get to work, please. Uh, today, uh, they, have 40 they have 40 million pages in uh, 299 languages, right? So means that, and that without any incentive and rewards, right? The hundreds of thousands of people who are delivering uh, and make Wikipedia what it is today are not asking for permission or money or anything, right? They're just doing it. Okay, and the last thing I will say on the development of the web is the connection uh, between text or images with text and data. So uh, in 2010, the Web Web, web Consortium uh, developed the Link Data Platform and uh, the reason I, I'm highlighting that is that uh, it has a serious impact, of course, on the search. Uh, like the web of hypertext, so sentence from Tim, like the web of hypertext, the web of data is constructed with documents on the web. Same thing at that level. However, unlike the web of hypertext, where links are relationship anchors in hypertext document written in HTML, for data, the link uh, between arbitrary things re described by RDF. It means that, of course, you can't put a link in the signal that you've measured on an equipment, right? You have to have a metadata layer on top where you will express those links. And that's the obstacle that we have to face in EOSC when we want to develop the search. The structure is not there up until you have developed um, you have developed the metadata layer. So here we go, 2018. I don't 
need to get into details because Ivan has presented where we are at the EOSC level. But uh, basically, that's my high-level summary of um, our uh, high-level summary of where we are. We are trying to develop, to move from the Gutenberg science, where publications were the, the current media uh, of exchange between scientists, to, to the Berners-Lee science, where we will share publication data and software. So I played the game, since I was asked to, to uh, try to compare uh, the situation uh, in order to you know, draw the lessons that I talked about. So for almost each of those eight elements, uh, the first one refers to the web, the second uh, to, the, to EOSC. So as I explained earlier, Mosaic was the minimum viable web uh, when it came out in 93. So we have to identify the minimum viable EOS. We all have this grand vision of you know, sharing data you know, uh, when we, the world will be accomplished, right? But uh, we have to identify it. Uh, in terms of organization, uh, the World Wide Web Consortium was hosted and we're thinking of a legal entity. Probably a good idea, but we have to figure out why. Uh, on the content, as I uh, explained, uh, you know, data are much more heterogeneous. Uh, they're much, they're, the volume uh, is there, therefore there are questions on sustainability. So the challenge is much more difficult uh, for, for EOSC. Uh, it's important when we start to look at what was available when, when you start. For the web, it was the internet. For EOSC, is the data infrastructure which are already existing and alive and used by scientists every day and so forth. So we're not starting from scratch at all. Uh, on the users, uh, for the web, it was for everyone. Uh, for EOSC, at least in the first place, please, uh, it's only for scientists. Yes, it will serve society, but please, let's start with scientists. Uh, IPR, royalty free, in the case of, uh, of the web. Fair and open, maybe, uh, for, for EOSC. Uh, discovery already mentioned, hyperlinks versus uh, metadata, and incentive, uh, I needed to be a little bit provocative. So there were none for the web. Do we need some for, for EOSC? It's up to you to say. Uh, now, uh, uh, as a conclusion to this very brief comparison, my take, so sometimes I can give my opinion, right? Uh, we need, uh, uh, there is a need for info innovative software. So what we need is rough consensus and running code, which is inherited not even from the web, but from the internet, right? Supported by Horizon Europe projects. All right, so as I said, uh, the, the users of the web were everyone, uh, and uh, for EOSC, it's the scientists. So uh, in 2012, at the London Olympics opening, of course, the British, uh, organizers asked Tim Berners-Lee uh, to present, and this is the sentence that he typed on his next machine, uh, you know, which showed uh, that uh, the web was for everyone. And of course, sure enough, in 2012, it was the case, right? Uh, the, the web has been, had been developed for everyone and use, and Tim had become Sir Tim Berners-Lee, right? Um, whereas, uh, we're only at the beginning. And I will close on this. Uh, call for new ways of science from uh, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. Elizabeth Blackburn is a Nobel laureate in biology. And uh, Nobel laureates meet every year in Lindau, close to the Constant Lake in Germany. Together, with 30, 40 uh, Nobel laureates meet with uh, 600 brilliant scientists, uh, young scientists. And these meetings have been held since the 50s, I believe. Uh, last year, 2019, Elizabeth Blackburn said, uh, we won't do science in the future the way we're doing science today. So she wrote, so I encourage you to go to the site, you can participate, she wrote uh, 10 goals for the way to evolve science in the coming uh, years. And during one year, so that's why I didn't blow a fuse, and 2020 is on purpose here. Uh, she gave a year uh, for input uh, to, to come in, and uh, so that in 2020, there will be a declaration from the 
Linda uh, Nobel laureate uh, about open science. So I will conclude on that. I encourage you to go there to think about what you could contribute. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jean-Francois. And last but not the least, uh, Dr. Zoya Cornier, a uh, research assistant professor f at Biomedical Research Foundation Academy of Athens. Uh, Zoya is working on uh, anti-cancer drug design using high-performance computing. She is, among other things, also founder of Ingridio, a mobile application that uses the benefits of open data. Take the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me to the symposium. Uh, it's a big honor to be here represent the users. Uh, so as Ivan said, I'm a researcher. I'm also a startupper. Uh, so I think I represent a, a majority of uh, users of EOSC. Uh, so it's a big responsibility to speak uh, uh, for all of us. Um, so as Ivan very well said, I am a researcher uh, in uh, personalized medicine, so using high performance computing, uh, we uh, design candidate drugs uh, for cancer and uh, use, doing that, we very much use the dynamics of the system, so the biological molecules are not like static uh, as we have used to see them in the textbooks, but they are very much dynamic. Um, so we uh, analyze, we simulate all these biological molecules uh, that are mutated in cancer and hope to find uh, new small molecules uh, that are targeted mutated proteins in cancer and hope to find new cures. So in this process we generate tons of data uh, that hopefully are useful not only to us but also to the community. Uh, at the same time um, by recognizing the dual nature of chemistry, I'm a chemist, so chemistry can cure with drugs, but chemistry can also be potentially harmful for us uh, from uh, the products that we use every day. Uh, for example, food and cosmetics uh, have uh, raised concerns about the chemical ingredients that they contain. So we have... Um, created a startup which is called Ingridio. It's a mobile phone application that uses open peer-reviewed data, um, in, uh, which is incorporated in our database in the mobile app. So it's very simple to use. You take uh, your phone, you take a picture of the product, you're in a grocery store, you're wondering what you're gonna buy. So you take a picture of the ingredient label, uh, you send it to our cloud, we analyze it again using peer-reviewed data, for example, from the European Commission, the COSIC database, or PubChem from the National Institutes of Health. So you send the information of the um, ingredient list to us, and immediately using a very easy to interpret color code scaling, you learn whether there is any of the ingredients in that product uh, that has been implicated uh, with allergies, toxicities, irritation, or even cancer. And of course, again, as I said, all that is using publicly available information and it's a service to the community. So with these two ex very brief examples that I shared from my own research, I think you can understand that uh, data that is open, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and reliable is really a key for driving scientific discoveries, but also for improving the quality of life for European citizens and for citizens of the world. So the current challenges that I am facing as a user is that I generate uh, tons of data, terabytes of data every month. So how can I store them? How can I manage them and analyze them? It's very difficult. Uh, sometimes the national infrastructures are not adequate. Also, what happens when I want to publish my data? Um, the journals, will they take the data sets, the terabytes of data, or will I uh, deposit them in an open repository so that other researchers have access, but how will they be able to find them as well? And how will I be able to find data sets of other scientists that have worked on similar pharmaceutical targets as me so that I don't have to duplicate the research that they have done? But unfortunately, uh, as in the case uh, of uh, Ingridio, that we're using uh, the peer-reviewed literature for chemical ingredients in food and cosmetics, the current databases are fragmented and largely dupl duplicating the research. Um, so one of uh, the, the, the key points here is 
to really share the data because the, progne the progress, the scientific progress, depends on the previous work. So we build on new discoveries, we build on old data to make new discoveries. Uh, also, the higher quality science is based on review data. So if your data, if you're forced to put your data online and it's accessible to everyone, you'll make sure that the data is correct and that they have data integrity. Science is expensive, we know, uh, we know that, so we, don't, we should not duplicate research. And um, the EU has reported that it spends about 10.2 billion euros per year for duplication of research results. Uh, also, sharing data is important because uh, we have a sense of giving back uh, to the community. So, the researchers have a responsibility to communicate the research results. So, let's see a recent study that was done by Willy um, for researcher data sharing. So, uh, in the poll that they uh, ran worldwide, it was found that 48% uh, don't share their data of researchers, while 52% uh, share their data, and the ways that they are sharing the data, those who do, is uh, supplementary materials in the journal, as we said, uh, personal, institutional pro project web page, uh, institutional data repositories, or specific repositories, so different fragmented uh, repositories. So why is 52%, this is huge, it's like half of the data is not being shared. What did the researcher respond? Why they're not sharing their data? So some of them said there's inf insufficient time, lack of funding, um, the data, uh, they don't have the right to make them public, there's no place to put their data, um, there's lack of standards, so there's no standardization of the inter uh, data, they're sponsored, so their university does not require, so they don't bother, um, they don't need it, uh, other reasons. Um, and I think uh, this is largely because um, the community is not ready to, to share, to, to, to embrace the sharing of data, largely also because of the journal policies that are not there, uh, but also the institutions and the scientists that are not up to date. Uh, and also, of course, there are no resources world, worldwide to look uh, up where to put this data and what data to upload. Uh, but 52%, uh, uh, sorry, 48%, 40, this is a typo, are sharing the data. But I can't find them, right? So I'm uh, trying to find uh, simulations of the same protein. I know they have been published, but I can't access the data sets. Why can't I find it? Uh, many times there's no overview of where the data is uh, deposited. Not all the content is visible. Uh, there is missing uh, metadata, annotations. Um, so people are not annotating, even when they're depositing their data, they're not annotating it, so I cannot access them with keywords. And a very uh, important problem that we currently face is that uh, the content is usually not machine readable. So sometimes it's scanned PDFs, but obviously it's not searchable. So uh, this data is not useful for me. Uh, and the other challenge that we're facing is the interoperability and reusability of data. So even if I've gone through all that obstacles, I found my data, now can I really use it, reuse it? Uh, but there's many times there's lack of standardization of information. Um, uh, there is no interoperability and reproducibility because they require agreeing on semantics, which usually doesn't happen. Um, there's no sense of a community uh, project, and there is also a huge cost associated in, with making all this standardization. Uh, and um, actually, a, very, a few days ago in November uh, 2019 in New York, uh, the Molecular Science Software Institute uh, which is an American institute. Uh, they had a workshop on molecular dynamics, which is a technique I use for simulations, software uh, interoperability. Uh, and it, it really seemed to be a very hot topic, uh, not only for Europe, but uh, worldwide. So the ideal case would actually be to rerun the analysis with the deposited data uh, and scripts and be able to reproduce uh, the data and then reuse it to go one step further to perform meta-analysis of this data and, and um, um, perform innovative research based on old knowledge, old data. So all of these barriers are there. Uh, the researchers uh, were facing all these challenges. So uh, how could we possibly remove those barriers? Um, 
Of course, uh, we can specify and update uh, guidelines, establish standards, increase the awareness of sharing the data. So like we said, there's 52% of people that are not sharing them, and some of them are not sharing because they're not aware of the fact that they, if they would share it, they would promote innovation. Um, another uh, thing would be to publish all data sets, even if the data sets are negative, so if they produce a negative result, they're still useful because they enable you to avoid uh, performing the research that will lead to nowhere. So even these negative data sets uh, is important. Uh, have lookup repositories for discoverability, standardize the information, and create a community. All of this, what I said, and of course the list is not inclusive, has been integrated in a wonderful thing uh, for us researchers, which is called the European Open Science Cloud, uh, which is the realization of the European Commission vision for a common and trusted environment for open science. Um, and I'm boring here uh, some slides for the 2016 communication of the European Cloud Initiative, uh, where you see that enable this digital transformation of research, we're going towards a more data-intensive, collaborative, and cross-disciplinary science. And the EOSC, the promise of EOSC, is that it, it will provide two million researchers like me and innovators with a service environment where we would be able uh, to manage our data, analyze them, store them, reuse across uh, disciplines, uh, thus increasing creativity, productivity, and reproducibility of research and driving innovation. Uh, this is a, a slide uh, from uh, the project that I'm uh, currently uh, working in. I'm implicated in IFOS Europe. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so this is uh, the EOSC vision. So basically, essentially today, uh, we have the dif different public institutions. So you see here EMBL from uh, the European Molecular uh, Biology Laboratory, which is a part of uh, what I do. Uh, also the e infrastructures, EGI, UDAGE, and Open Air. And then these freeze the uh, research infrastructures, all these are different entities with providing different services, but they should really be federated into one. So from fragmented ser services and uneven access to a really federated model where access would be universal. And this is what EOSC represents. Um, and this is borrowed from EOSC um, website where you see the different uh, attributes that have been uh, uploaded, uh, architecture, data, services, access and interface, and of course, rules and governance, because the sharing of data also needs uh, to be uh, governed by rules about how to share the research. Um, and uh, this is from a recent uh, EOSC webinar that I followed as a user, very interested about what kind of initiatives have been developed. The portal has been developed, so the EOSC portal is there for us. Uh, and it, it is starting to be populated with new services uh, and users. And we have a part of governance and policy, the Infra EOSC 05, which is actually uh, four different projects, which are the four different regions of Europe. Uh, so the EOSC pillar, Central and Western Europe, EOSC Synergy, and EFOS Europe, uh, it's a Balkan countries and uh, Eastern uh, Europe, and EOSC Nordic. And all of these are essentially pillars of EOSC at different European um, countries, uh, where they will be able to disseminate common objectives and bring the research communities together. Uh, for example, uh, the objectives are to map and integrate all these national and local services into the different four uh, projects and then bring all of these federated into one big project, the EOSC. Uh, enhancement of EOSC with new thematic services. Uh, technical and policy measurements, measures, policy harmonization, and of course the promotion of the fair data, the open research data management, and supporting the governance. So uh, personally, I'm a part of uh, NIFOS Europe, so I come from Greece, and this is, uh, Hungary is also uh, in this one, I think. Uh, and uh, this is called uh, NIFOS Europe, also with the participation of Armenia and Georgia. So we have 22 partners of 15 countries, and each part of the four uh, different um, 
projects has different European countries. So all this will be brought together. And I think we have uh, common objectives to support uh, and develop the inclusion of the open science cloud in the different countries that each project is implicated to spread the EOSC and FAIR principles and open research data management, uh, provide technical and policy support in onboarding all the services from the users. So basically, before I go into very specific examples of how this would be realized for us, the users, the overall ambition uh, is essentially to have this user-friendly environment um, which should be findable, accessible, inter interoperable, and reusable scientific data. And when I presented this to the MOLSI uh, workshop that I talked about to you in New York early November, everybody was extremely excited. The, the US uh, researchers, they came to me and they asked if they can use EOSC, uh, because clearly this is not what Europe needs, it's what the world needs. We need to be able to have one federated platform where we will be able to find and reuse access data that are interoperable and reliable. So this is a huge advancement of the European Commission. Um, so let's see now some case studies. So as I said, I'm working on molecular dynamic simulations of protein cancer targets. And you see here a simulation of a, a cancerous protein uh, that's creating terabytes of data that I have to store somewhere. Uh, so very clearly, the, ben the first benefit that I have from EOSC is uh, to store, manage, and analyze all these terabytes of produced data, to share the data sets to the community upon publication, also to access data sets from my colleagues, similar data sets, so I don't have to duplicate research. Uh, I can also do a more efficient data set searching, uh, also, as a researcher, I'm writing my own software, so I have web-based ser servers that currently are in our local infrastructure, but I want to share this with the community, so I would be able with EOSC to onboard the web-based thematic services in one common unified portal to get training on open science and fair principles, because as we said, building of the community is one very important point, uh, which finally would enable open innovation seamlessly. As I said, we also have our own software. This is all software created uh, from my lab for a drug discovery project, as well as the Ingridio app that I showed you. We would love that all this would be in one platform. It would not be in our local infrastructures where actually it's not findable. So if for service providers, there's other benefits that EOSC provides, which is to publish, share, and advertise the services. Instead of having it in your local server, what if you would have huge visibility by one federated uh, and unified uh, European Open Science Cloud. You would get statistics about access and feedback. Uh, you'd have a free online platform to manage service requests, interact with your users to know what they want, uh, get support for user authentication because remember all of this is supported by the European Commission, and then you would open your service to a, a wider base. All this, uh, I looked into the portal, so it's all there, very user-friendly. I actually uh, clicked on storage here. I was immediately able to access the storage. I, uh, a big list of TRL-8 projects came up. I chose one of them to store my data. Uh, but I have to say, I understand that the project uh, is uh, not there yet, it's just starting, uh, because from the moment I actually clicked on uh, having to asking to store my data. It has been 23 days, and I still, I have some, re so there's an exchange of information with the administrator, but I, it's still not clear whether I will be able to store it. Uh, so I understand uh, it's, it's very much in the beginning, uh, but this is a huge promise for researchers, and I, pretty sure, I'm very sure that it will be able to fulfill the mandate of open science, and I really honestly hope that it will. And uh, to close, I would like to, to give you uh, a use case example. So when EOSC will be there and will be able to fill in the mandate, I think we will be seeing huge impacts on personalized medicine uh, where we can use EOSC services uh, to provide the right drug to the right patient for the right disease at the right time and with the right dosage. How we could do this, this is an example that I'm taking from services that will be onboarded in UFOS Europe. Uh, this is extracting correlations for patient stratification using machine learning. What does that mean? 
it sounds very buzzy, uh, but let's say these people have unfortunately cancer, but cancer is not one disease, it's many different diseases, and it seems like these people have a different type of cancer. So using correlations, uh, you could actually separate these cancer patients into three different subgroups that would benefit more by taking a specific drugs. All this could be done uh, by EOS services uh, when, for example, we could stratify patients for meloma cancer types uh, based on existing data. Uh, for example, if we had an existing biomarker data set, we have the technology of machine learning. Here we have two thematic services from NIFOS Europe, MELGENE, by three, sorry, BioConnect and EML. Here they are. BioConnect is an online tool offering comprehensive discovery solution uh, for omics data sets. EML is a highly sophisticated machine learning and interpretation framework de deployment tool. And MELGENE is a database which has the systemic meta-analysis of genetic polymorphisms in cutaneous melanoma. Uh, so here is the machine learning tools, and here is the melanoma biomarker database. This is a thematic service onboarded, let's say, to EOSC. This is a, a hypothetical use case. This calculation could be then performed on LEO GPU cluster, which is a generic service of NIFOS Europe. The results would be stored in an archival and simple storage service from the storage service pool of NIFOS Europe. And finally, uh, the uh, results would be able to be available in the generic cloud storage and a repository open to the public. So finally, I think uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a really, it's a huge project with a huge impact for researchers uh, and entrepreneurs uh, that will allow the new generation of researchers and scholars to find, combine, analyze data and discoveries, but also for the community because it will accelerate the transition to open science and open innovation, bring science and research closer to societal needs, and transform research faster and more cost efficiently to products such as drugs, such as stratifying patients that benefit patients. So the final vision, and I'm sure it will be fulfilled, uh, is to have the global open science as a driver uh, for uh, enabling a new paradigm of transparent data-driven science as well as accelerating innovation. But the point here is, and I'm saying this to all EOSC officials because as scientists we're extremely excited about that, is to interlink the researchers and entrepreneurs, data, services, training, publications, projects, and organization across borders across disciplines, and to do this in a timely manner, an efficient manner. So EOSC needs to be in constant communication with the users uh, so that the services make sense. So I don't have to wait for 23 days to upload my data sets, otherwise I will go somewhere else and then the point is gone. Uh, so, for, so, that the, so, sorry, so that the services make sense for entrepreneurs and scientists. And I am sure that then we will see the enabling of a new paradigm of transparent research accelerating open innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe. With this excellent promotion from, from uh, scientists, uh, I'm closing the opening plenary session. I, I will say a word, these are the champions, these are the ambassadors of EOSC and I think we should salute them. Okay, this, by this presentation, the first session is closed, now there is a coffee break and why I don't ask for question right now because we exceed times and I'm sure that during coffee break or during the sessions that we follow next three days you will ask have opportunity to ask questions. Thanks again to Istvan, to, to Zoe, to Jean-Pierre, and to myself.